I've always had a very special place in my heart for Aaron. And I think anyone who's been in a leading in a leadership position might say the same. Even the best of us forget to aim sometimes before we shoot, especially when people are loudly unhappy and want decisions to be made yesterday. And sometimes the results of a quick, high pressure decision works out okay. Other times, as in Aaron's case, they're full of bull. I feel for the guy. Moses has left Aaron in charge and has taken off for parts unknown and has been gone quite a while already. So the people are restless and they're worried. Come, make gods for us, they entreat Aaron. And at that point, one thing we can say for the people is at least they know their need for God or gods. So the crowd turns on Moses, who has been gone way too long. There they are, the people are out in the middle of nowhere. They feel alone and unprotected. A burning bush, a walking stick that turns into a snake and then back into a stick again. Ten plagues, released from captivity, the Red Sea parted and Pharaoh's army destroyed. Daily food and water provided in the wilderness. And all the respect that Moses gets from his people is something like, we don't know what has become of him which is a little like saying, well, so that was then, but this is now. What have you done for us lately? Their fickleness isn't news to Aaron. He's been with them the entire time. I think a case can be made that Aaron is showing good leadership skills, even if his response is more ready, fire, aim. There's a problem, so he finds a solution. And when he has told the people to go and collect all the gold jewelry, he really might be just trying to buy some time. It's a pretty decent stall tactic, if you think about it. Maybe he hopes people won't want to give up their gold jewelry as much as they seem to. And with so many people, the gathering up is going to take a while. But according to the narrative, the time lapse doesn't matter. In two verses, Aaron goes from requesting the gold to casting the, the calf. And incidentally, who brings a casting mold of a calf with them into the wilderness anyway? So Aaron tries to recover something for the God of Moses. He says, tomorrow will be a festival to the Lord. He's not playing to the other gods game, but the people take the party over, eating and drinking, According to scripture, they rose up to revel. From wherever they were up high on that mountain, God notices what happens. And he says to Moses, go down at once. Your people, your people whom you brought out of Egypt are acting perversely. Now, I don't know if you notice anything a little odd there, but there is something. Clearly, it was the Lord who brought them out of Egypt. So there is some blame shifting going on here. This reminds me a little bit of how when I was a child, my mom would say to my dad when he got home from work after a hard day in the summer with my bratty brothers, your sons need your attention. God is angry, seemingly at Moses as the one in charge. And it takes Moses some quick thinking to remind God of God's promises and of who this people really belongs to and what he promised to do. But going back for a moment, from the outside looking in, it seems as if Aaron had come up with a pretty good solution. If you wanted to so survive in the world as they all knew it, you had to sacrifice to God's. But when push comes to shove and when Aaron has to report what happened, he too shifts the responsibility. In Hebrew, what he says more or less literally is, possibly with a shrug, hey, we threw this gold into the fire and out came this calf. Go figure. Sometimes what really feels like a right decision, one that may have been made for all of the right reasons, 
is actually the wrong one in God's eyes. This is the challenge of the ready, fire, aim strategy. Something very like that is happening too in this morning's gospel. Mostly we imagine we know what Jesus is talking about in his parable about the king who tried to give a wedding banquet for his son. We tend to imagine that the king is a stand-in for God and maybe those who first ignored his invitations were the Jews who ignored the message of the gospel. But take a long hard look at this king. He is merciless, precocious, and violent. We might well wonder just why the people invited to this banquet decided not to come. Could it be because they didn't really want to share or break bread at the table with this particular king? Could it be if they could avoid it, they really didn't want to have anything to do with them? So, excuse me. So this horrible king gives up on his gentry and invites all and everyone to come to the feast, now cooked and prepared, and likely by now in danger of going to waste. People at random, bad and good alike, we're told. Apparently at that point, the king didn't even care whether they were bad or good. He just wants somebody to get there and eat his food. Until he runs across someone who has come, but who is most seriously un underdressed for that occasion. So the king takes that least of his guests as a kind of scapegoat for his anger, for all that had gone before when he couldn't get the guest to show up, perhaps. And he binds him hand and foot and tosses him out of the party and into the outer darkness. So let's consider this king as a false and terrifying depiction of God as often happens. As followers of Christ Jesus, do we really believe in a God as petty, vengeful, hot-headed, and thin-skinned as the king in this parable? A God who cast an impoverished guest into the outer darkness for reasons that the guest can't control? Obviously, the answer is no, or I hope it is. Of course we don't believe in a God as monstrous as that. Or do we? I wonder now if Jesus tells that parable in such an extreme and offensive way precisely because we do tend to believe in a God as harsh as this king who turns his armies loose on his own people to kill them. And we need the help of a little hyperbole in order to see it. Is it possible that Jesus is offering us a critical description of how God's kingdom is too often depicted by God's own followers? What if the king in the parable isn't God at all? What if the king is just our own stuff projected onto God? What if the king actually embodies everything we've learned to associate with power from watching other all too human rulers? kings like Herod, conquerors like the Roman Empire of Jesus' day, leaders in our own time and place who exercise authority in abusive, violent ways, compelling their followers to gleefully celebrate in circumstances that actually call for lament. Do we consciously or not present to the world a God who is easily offended easily displeased, easily dishonored, a God whose holiness rests on the foundation of an unyielding and even violent anger, a God whose need to save face finally trumps his own graciousness and hospitality, a God whose invitation to salvation has strings attached to it. It's too easy enough, I think, to say, no, of course we don't. But we are surrounded by people who have been victimized by the God of what is often referred to as organized religion. Many of whom refuse to share the table we share or celebrate with such a ruthless ruler if they can avoid it. 
and many of us, maybe not here, some who will not grace the table with us, carry deep wounds from the years or decades spent appeasing the king we mistook for God. The kingdom of heaven is to maybe compared to a king who gave a wedding banquet for his son. Jesus says by way of an introduction to this parable. So, okay, what if we take him at his word? What might we learn if we attempt an honest comparison between God's coming kingdom promised and our current one? Are our tables open to all who come? Really? Do we take offense when people shy away from our banquet? Or do we listen as they explain why our invitation strikes them as either unappealing or outright frightening? Do we really want to open our arms that wide or do we really have a secret stake in seeing some people end up in the outer darkness? Let's consider the possibility of seeing this parable with new eyes. What if the God figure in the parable is actually the one guest who refuses to accept the terms of the tyrannical king? The one guest who decides not to wear the robe of a forced celebration and coerced hilarity. The one guest whose silent resistance leaves the king himself speechless and brings the whole fake feast to a halt the one brave guest who decides he'd rather be bound hand and foot and cast into the outer darkness of Gethsemane, Calvary, the cross, and the grave, than accept the authority of a violent, loveless leader. What would change for you if Jesus was the humbled, unrobed guest and not the furious king in the story? Could you resist the pomp and fakery and go with him when he's escorted into the darkness, bound and broken for the sake of love? On a podcast with David Axelrod, Lynn manuel Miranda talks about the time Stephen Sondheim visited his high school classroom and told the story about creating the opening of the musical West Side Story. Sondheim revealed that they had gone weeks and weeks putting in works on lyrics to this one song, only for choreographer Jerome Robbins to say, hey, I can dance all of that better. So they threw away all of those lyrics, all of those weeks of work. Sometimes we have to toss out even our good stuff to make room for God's best. Sometimes we have to throw out our own stuff so we can get to God's best stuff and God's promises. Which means sometimes, as Moses says to Aaron, we gotta let go of the bull. Amen.